Some questions now from the audience. My name is Addis. I work for the Stockholm Environment Institute. And uh, I wonder how you see the climate finance in contrast to, to aid. And uh, if you see, you look at the convention, it says that it should be new and additional. And both countries have signed the convention. And at the same time, CEDA released a report last week on fast start finance, where they specifically mentioned that all of the fast start finance was taken from the aid budget, which means that it wasn't new and additional. So can you just elaborate on, on the future of climate finance, please? We also take the second question, and then you can. Thank you. Uh, Roger Williamson, Institute of Development Studies. A question for uh, you, Minister Gunilla uh, Carlson. Uh, Minister, I was pleased to hear you say that you aren't done with the poverty eradication agenda. Um, <coughs> in relation to the MDGs, Millennium Development Goals, it was a good idea. It's been partially fulfilled. It's galvanized a lot of action. But after 2015, what do you want to see happen, and what's emerging from this high-level group? Who wants to start? Gunilla, should I start? Well, we just presented today, me, me and Christian actually, the reports on the high-level panel, and I think we have still a lot of work to do on the current MDGs, and they have to be fulfilled, because otherwise we will have not a credibility to move into the next generations. But the next generation of, of goals, whatever they are called, have to be much more universal. They have to really address root causes of poverty and to really deal with globalization for all. So I think we would have a different agenda, but where we still would have to take into consideration the situations of fragility, where we still have to invest in global health, education, and so on and so forth. So I would like to see the effect, the, the knowledge from the MDGs to be, to be in one way inherited to, to the next generation, where we really can, and that's the good thing, we can uh, really see that we end poverty in our times. But in order to make it sustainable, we also have to address the effects of climate change. And therefore, I think also the question on financing for the moment, it is that I've been really fighting so hard because I started early my part as a Minister for Development Corporation to look into, and we set up a commission on climate change and, and development already in 2008 to learn about adaptation and the need for adaptation in the developing countries. At that time, it was fairly new. It was not so long time ago. It was public goods to start to talk about these things. And I wanted to learn more and to see where are we. And I've said constantly that if you should take it from the aid budget, it should be addressing adaptation mainly and addressing the poor people situation because otherwise you can't describe it as aid. And that's why I think the problem we do have is that it's ODA eligible. And that's why it could be poured upon me to do a lot of things that I perhaps shouldn't. And as long as we are doing this in the Swedish government, we really are channeling it through CEDA, most of it, in order to see also that it's done coherently to aid. Then I think for a long term now, we will have much more financing to really fill the gaps. And there I think we have to find other innovative sources without looking to ODA, because ODA is really relatively small in the big numbers needed and also the potentials we see, for example, in the private sector. Uh, and there we have to change behavior. Christian? Uh, to add this on, on additionality in climate finance, I agree it's a, it's, it's a big challenge. Uh, what we have done in Denmark is to divide up our international engagement in two frames. One we call the poverty frame, and the other one we call the global frame. And uh, the climate mitigation part we put in the global frame. And then we try to protect the poverty frame from all the different international global uh, issues that are constantly uh, pushing themselves into our development uh, partnerships. So. So uh, we have refugees, um, we have uh, some of our business uh, tools, uh, uh, we have security and we have climate uh, change with the focus on mitigation in the global frame. So then we say, let's protect the poverty frame and hopefully we can get that to 0.7%. We are close, not yet there, but then get a pow poverty frame of 0.7% and then talk about additionality. Upon, upon. I think that's how it's going to materialize in the, in, in the future. Now. Uh, and then we need to measure our leveraging. Uh, and I think, because if you take about climate finance and the 100 billion we've promised in 2020, it's from all sources. It specifically says it's from all sources, uh, also private sources. So we need to be able to measure, what I, now I mentioned our climate investment fund. 
we need to be able to measure to what extent we, by innovative mechanisms, can mobilize private finance in support of climate mitigation and adaptation in poor countries. That's absolutely crucial. And here we need a lot of work internationally. The ODA definition is already under pressure, big time, in the OECD DAC discussions. Uh, and there we need to now stand firm on the poverty focus, but then develop new reporting mechanisms for what's uh, on top of that. And just to Roger, now, I think the, the, the high-level panel report is brilliant, and Gunilla uh, uh, should take a lot of pride in that because she played a crucial role in getting some of the really difficult issues on the report. It's a brilliant starting point for the post-2015 discussions, which will now uh, be uh, moving into an intergovernmental process. And the good thing is that now we have also understood, back to climate, development, whatever, you have all four dimensions of sustainability, I say today, uh, into those goals, because you have the social goals, the environmental goals, and the economic goals, and then you have peace and freedom of violence as the fourth dimension of sustainability. It's all there. It's a brilliant platform for us to start the negotiations on the future set of goals. Thank you. Please. Tom Hurdle, Purdue University. Yes, I have a question, it's kind of a follow-up on the opening remark from the remarks from the uh, two ministers. So the Swedish minister, minister of development, appropriately highlighted the importance of not forgetting about poverty. That's ultimately what we're about. Uh, the Danish minister spoke about win-win opportunities. But what about when these are really win-lose situations? Um, and I, I bring up the Red Plus example that got a lot of discussion this morning. Um, one of the, clearly one of the low-cost vehicles for mitigating climate change in the future is Red Plus. Payments to land, payments to keeping that land out of agriculture, keeping it in tropical forests. But uh, recent studies have shown that this raises food prices substantially. Furthermore, the payments for red typically don't go to the poor. The poor are poor because they don't own land. Mm. They don't get land-based payments. The same with payments for environmental services. So here you have a bit of a contradiction, a bit of a tension, Christian, between your two um, separate category <laughs> groups, the global and the poverty one. How do, we, how do we come to grips with that kind of a situation? Now you have to start. Yeah. Uh, well, uh, uh, I, I'm not saying forgetting poverty, but I think you also say in the research here that the best way to do adaptation is actually economic growth and getting rid of poverty. So, so it, it comes together. And, and, and for this specific instance, yes, then you need to be more innovative and combine the development and the climate interventions in smart ways. And in the case you talk about, Red Plus must be combined with stronger land rights for indigenous people, and it must be combined with better investments in a sustainable intensification of the agriculture that's left. Uh, and that has to come together. Uh, so this is not an argument uh, against the Red Plus, but it's an argument in favor of moving on development policies uh, and climate mitigation at the same time. And as I said, land rights for indigenous people, it's crucial to get the benefits to those who should receive it. Investments in agriculture, Ch Channing and Finn said it, uh, in stronger than anybody, it's crucial to mitigate the effects that it can have on food prices, not only keeping land uh, to forest, but also, which we know, losing 25% of land areas to climate change. Uh, so agriculture is absolutely essential in all of these aspects. And then we need to find innovative ways of paying farmers and foresters to do the right thing. And, uh, and payment for ecosystem services will come in big time, I think. I have my small farm, which we visited once, uh, <laughs> and I do almost nothing useful on that farm anymore. Uh, <laughs> it's all forest and greenlands, and because I paid to do it, and I get the same subsidies regardless of what I do, so why don't I do some climate mitigation uh, on my farm as well? But for many farmers around in the world, that incentive structure is not there anywhere, and we need to create it. If not, we are never going to get uh, solve the climate uh, crisis because you cannot do it without agriculture. It's 30% of emissions, and we need to cut it by half if to, to reach uh, if you take farm forestry. So we cannot reach the targets on climate change and two degrees without agriculture and farm uh, and forest. Uh, and there we need payments for ecosystem services done 
and their development policy comes in, done in a way that creates less poverty and combats climate change at the same time. Thank you. <coughs> you listen to the ministers now, huh? and we talked all day about what should be done in developing countries. Now, if you should give them a couple of good advices, how to best do foreign aid, what would that be? I'll talk about three things. First, we've, we've both of us agreed on the need to dialogue the more. Yeah. That is very, very important. I think one area is what uh, was mentioned earlier on, that if we'll be able to see um, the threat of climate change, and for that matter, uh, aid will have that as a, a new and additional source that will definitely support us in the uh, developing world. But the third aspect is, I will talk about is, though we looking at the um, developed partners scaling up aid, I think African leaders ourselves should also reposition ourselves so that climate change become a stark reality in Ghana affecting cocoa production, affecting our water because we, we, we uh, power it from hydro largely. What is Ghana itself doing towards climate change? And I think it is so important that we wouldn't need to look at it only from academic you know, angle. As politicians, what do we need to do to make sure that we mainstream climate change in development policies? I think that should be a third area. The capacity building that we need will still come to uh, the uh, support of development um, partners to support us in that area, building capacity in the institutions that will um, really need to design development policies that will respond to climate change. Thank you very much and thank you ministers for coming here. A big applaud for all three. Mm -hmm.